my fragmented work history. Why is it that I can produce pretty much anyone's CV tailored to their own job search, but have an awful lot of trouble just updating mine? Is it a, simply a case of the shoemaker can't fix her own shoes? Or is it because I wired differently than most people whose CVs I produce? Stick around kids, you shall soon find out later in this video. talking floor chick coming at you and welcome to the channel I want to take this opportunity to thank all my new subscribers I got five new subs the past week so thank you for joining this bumpy ride if you're new here we discuss social issues of the day with an emphasis but not exclusively to mental health issues with addiction learning disabilities etc it's basically my little rant corner of the intertubes. If you are into this kind of thing, please consider subscribing and hit that little ringy-dingy icon below so you can be notified every time I upload. As mentioned in my most recent video, the introduction to mental health and employment and why it's problematic, the series, this will be a multiple video series covering everything pretty much on this topic. Interviews with those suffering from mental health and or addiction issues, along with perhaps the neurological issues like learning disabilities and autism spectrum, and their journeys with employment, as well as some shorter vlogging essays on the subject with statistics and some sciency fun. If you haven't seen the introduction video, it's in the info card above, as well as below in the description box. By the by, if you are interested in being interviewed or want to tell your own story with mental health issues and employment and or education or training programs, I want to hear from you. Please look at the criteria at the end of this video as well as in the description box below. There will be links also in the description box with the many ways you can get in touch with me. Like I said, I really want to hear from you. As mentioned, there will be personal stories from people I will be interviewing, different backgrounds, professionally and personally speaking, both men and women, different age brackets, etc. I think it's only fair that I get the ball rolling on this series with my own story, which will be in two separate videos. This one, and one that should be uploaded before the weekend, about how I got from sick leave to full out retirement. In this video, as suggested in the title, I will be talking about my own spotty, problematic employment history. Unlike most teenagers, other than the odd babysitting job or newspaper delivery, I did not really have a part-time job like many of my peers did, partly because I had a lot of trouble just completing high school, and partly because when I was of age to work, we lived in a rural area far out of the way from everything. I must add that where I lived, most of the kids from my high school either worked for their parents or other relatives' companies. You know, good old nepotism makes the world go round. Given both my parents were unionized civil servants, I did not have that luxury. So my first foray at a so-called real job, real, was when I was 18. This was the late night shift. Midnight to 4 a.m. at a Burger King smack in downtown Montreal. I had gotten the job through a job search program for youth aged 17 to 23 at the downtown YMCA. I also had a very strange living situation, to say the least. One where I was living in a home in the northeast end of Montreal 
for women over the age of 18, run by nuns. It was supposed to be an extension of any given women's shelter with some structured programming. With exception, there would be some girls aging out of group home, get the odd referral. And of course, there was a supervised apartment program for later. In my case, what started out as a semi-optional living situation, it ended up later as a condition of my probation. So I had to live there or I would end up in prison. Basically as simple as that. But I digress. But I promise this particular living situation is vital to my story. And I think the people that worked at the home contributed negatively to my issues with employment at such a young age. When I was at Burger King, I had no welfare. I had no source of revenue. So the sporadic part-time hours were not sufficient. We did have to pay two-thirds of our monthly income to the home as room and board. Long story short, whenever I was called in for a shift, I was consistently yelled at, barraged, bullied, poked fun at for not being fast enough or not learning at the fast pace as I should have. I would never be fast enough. I always had lifelong issues with fine motor skills, among other things. I still do to this day. I was not working at the cash at the front with the other girls. I was with the dudes in the back in that stifling, stinky, greasy kitchen, doing whatever I was ordered to do. Yep, yelling at somebody with PS PTSD is never a good idea. But then what do they know about PTSD? But that mental talking about mental health was still considered quite taboo back in the decade of excess. There was no particular pecking order with the kitchen staff, so there was no structure, no sense of order. People just tripping all over each other and then barking orders at each other. Yeah. What an environment to thrive in. <laughs> Everybody was just nasty and unpleasant, and the ambiance was awful. The more time went on, the worse things got. I found myself more often than not cowering in corners, either having a panic attack or crying for lack of knowledge of an appropriate response. I would continuously fall apart emotionally. This, my friends, is pretty much the story of my life. Not just my working life, but also my personal life. I ended up having to quit the job anyway. Honestly, I think the management at that Burger King were about to can me anyway. The night before I quit, night manager caught me during a panic attack, once again cowering in my favorite corner. She ordered me to move, but I simply couldn't. This, my friends, is a lesson to you. Somebody having a panic attack, somebody dealing with an anxiety attack, or they are stuck in a crisis of depression, you can tell them to move all they want. When we say this is crippling, please take our word for it because what I just described was that, a crippling panic attack. Didn't matter what threats were issued at me. I couldn't move, couldn't answer. You know, kids, it's funny I mentioned Burger King in the first part of my spotty resume. As I did a video on Burger King and Bell's corporate hypocrisy and exploitation regarding mental illness not that long ago, link to that video is in the info card above. My work history with them is a prime example of that. When I did quit, the counselors at the home were chastising me for not wanting to start at the bottom of the ladder of employment. I look back now and thought, these were frickin' counselors with backgrounds in special education. Social work, criminology, and psychology, yet they couldn't or refused to recognize panic attacks. I was not the only resident at the home to be chastised for this sort of thing, neither. They told me I either had to find a job PDQ and they were referring me to a yet another youth job search program, one that would last about 16 weeks with a minimum wage salary paid. I guess at the time I was open to that, not like I had anything else going on at the time. 
Thought maybe I could learn what to do with the panic attacks, pick up some life skills, because this program did offer life skills uh, workshops. You know, not run into the same pitfalls I did at Burger King. There were women at the home back at school, either for completing their high school, leaving in adult ed, or they were in literacy classes. Because I was the most educated gal in the home, meaning... I was the only resident who completed high school. They didn't want to prioritize education with me. Yes, heaven forbid I should go above high school, right? I didn't want to go to Sejap, sort of. I would have preferred Sejap over working in fast food, that's for sure. But again, they said no. Now I know you asked boys and girls, what would have happened if I defied them and did just that? Go to Sejap. Well, I felt trapped in this home, and they likely would have given me the boot with nowhere to go. So as bad as the living situation was, it was all I had at the moment. Also, as a reminder, my probation conditions required me to live there. If I were booted out, particularly with no place to go, I would surely have been obligated to finish out my sentence in prison. An afternoon in a cop shop lockup was scary enough for me at the time of my arrest less than a year prior. They also had an issue with me going to Sejap because I was going to major in social science. You know, that babysitter for directionless high school grads. Not that I would have remained in that major. I would have just gotten my feet in the door so I could actually be a fine arts major. Time to get a portfolio together and such. What few interests I did have back then, that is, besides rock and roll, was art. I'm still not sure why to this day the folks were at the home were so insistent that I look for another crappy job I was sure to fail at rather than attend school. It was like I was being penalized for actually having a high school diploma. But the job search program at the home was offering me appeared to be my best option at the moment. At least, there would be other misfits like yours truly, some even with a criminal record like I did, some who had the anxieties and the sensitivities I did, those who were bullied or came from abusive households, kindred spirits in other words. I would have had steady income at the moment. Program went fine. I learned the basics of how to use a computer. There were many life skills workshops in addition to how to fill out job applications or write out a resume or CV curriculum vitae, depending where you come from. For the life of me, I can't remember the name of the program. Oh boy. The program ended up sending me to some job on the job training at Coho's which now long since defunct was a discount clothing store. Call it a sort of prelude to winners. The program continued to pay my salary through that five week period. They were nice enough at Coho's, but I was stuck doing grunt work no one wanted to do, like taking inventory off the racks, sweeping the floors, basically cleaning up and checking an eye out for shoplifters in the change rooms. In other words, no real marketable skills, but at least no bouts of panic attacks or crying or cowering in a corner, no emotional breakdowns to report there. <sighs> but when the program ended, and once again back to the pressures of finding work from the home and not knowing when I would get income, it was causing no shortage of anger and grief and anxiety for me, which no one was hearing me when except, of course, for my psychiatrist at the time, who in turn decided it would be a good idea to fill out disability forms for me to receive welfare with a disability supplement. He felt that as long as I couldn't control my emotions, it was not a good idea to spring me at employers at large. I did what I was supposed to do, but the nuns who ran the home did all to overrule my medical papers by finding their own doctors, social workers, stuff like that. Before I could submit the papers, though, however, an interesting opening came up. 
one-year contract that ran with Canada Manpower and the home I was living in. That's right, the job's employer was also the nuns that were running the home I was staying in. It was a little company called Essar, and it was a silk painting, printing, painting scarves, producing greeting cards, some jewelry, postcards. I thought, what the hell, this could work for me. Could work well if I was trying to get into art school later. Would certainly help me to create that portfolio that I would need for my eventual entry, right? Since the company was a non-profit that was run by the administration of the home I was staying at, there would be other marginalized women working there. Thus, my mental health issues wouldn't have been as much of an issue as it would have been elsewhere. I felt I had a good shot because, after all, the administrator and my caseworker at the home were all so hell-bent that I go to work, right? I would have been thought to be a shoe in well, oh hell, I was wrong. I did not get the position. And that was the straw that broke the camel's back for me at that time. It was also then I knew that this home was setting me up for failure. And I had no idea why. There was no way I was going to succeed at much of anything as long as I was living at that home. Probation or no probation. I did look into another supervised housing program where a friend of mine at the time was. It offered more freedom, a little less structure, and fewer people. Plus, the apartments were co-ed. Another bonus. I was, after all, looking for Mr. D uh, Wright at the time. Yay! I figured that the supervised housing program would still be considered okay to the probation officer. By this time, a year later, my probation was almost done anyway. Only had a month or so left of it. I ended up not getting into that home after all, but there was a girl at the home who was also preparing to leave. She couldn't handle the stupid rules neither. So off I did. I moved in with that girl. And also by that time, I was having some revenue coming in. The welfare office had accepted my psychiatrist's paperwork to recommend disability for me. So at least there was one less stressor. I could pay my share of rent for the long haul. Wouldn't be much, but it would be okay. I am not going to go into too much detail about that life. That'll be for another video, for another time. Suffice to say, with this roommate, it's when I first developed my love-hate relationship with cocaine. Another video for another time, like I said. Oh, fast forward to 1990. I was living in Montreal Southwest area in a neighborhood of St. Henry long before it was gentrified. Still one of the poorest districts of Montreal at the time with some of the oldest triplexes and duplexes in the city. Still home to some motorcycle gangs. Hell, I loved it. In fact, I think it was my favorite neighborhood of all of Montreal and believe me boys and girls when I tell you, I live pretty much all over the island. I was still on welfare disability at the time and at the behest of my psychiatrist. However, I wanted to try my hand again at working. I knew this would be difficult as it was. For one thing, I had no references. No references, you might as well not bother applying. So this was already problematic. However, following a letter from my psychiatrist giving the okay to start a work program, my agent at the welfare office was going to sign me up for the uh, pay program. This was usually working for nonprofits who could use the extra hands but had no money to pay the full salary. So the welfare office would kick in almost half the salary. The problem, of course, with such programs is that the participants often do not come out with marketable skills. They simply, once again, do the grunt work like scrubbing toilets. Tasks nobody wants to do. I did, however, hate pay dirt, so to speak. The welfare office had a position for me at a religious and community center for the Sephardic Jews of Montreal. It also had a rabbinical college attached to it. I was apprehensive. After all, not Jewish. I always figured they would have preferred to hire Jews given the customs and traditions and such. The place, after all, was a religious one. 
I was assured that I would not be working under the head rabbi. I would be working under Robert, the director general of the place who basically handled all things not religious. Thus, my not being Jewish would not have been a problem. So I tried it out. I actually did get the chance to learn new computer skills. The office software programs of the day, like Lotus 123 and Word Perfect 5, about an hour daily was left for me to take computer tutorials, actually. Robert and his wife were always very patient and kind to me. I got above minimum wage simply because they preferred round figures. They would often feed me lunch, and sometimes when a catered event was happening downstairs in the reception hall, Robert would send me down to get food for myself before there was none left. Oh, so many fun stories about that place. One of the few workplaces I actually had fond memories of. I would struggle with the part-time jobs during the few years I was at school. Yes, it was at that time I started at Concordia University. Had three different majors, couldn't keep up, and I flunked spectacularly out. That was good. My learning disabilities were just not compatible with the way university is run, especially those huge classroom sizes and the competitive nature of it. But again, another video for another time. The learning disabilities video I plan to come out with soon. But the part-time jobs once again failed due to my issues, my sensitivities, my anxieties. I also found myself with no income and nearly homeless. I ended up checking into the ER at the hospital where my psychiatrist worked. I found an ad in a weekly downtown community paper for someone looking for roommates and I went to check out the place. By then, the psychiatrist had put me back on welfare with a disability supplement so I can find somewhere to live. But that did present its challenges, though. Anyone looking to share their home wanted no welfare recipients, similar to landlords renting to prospective tenants. No matter how one slices it, even if there is a disability of any kind of, of kind attached, welfare presents its own stigmas. And it's usually renders one persona non grata. So against doctor's orders, I attempted another job. I worked at a Dunkin' Donuts downtown. Why the hell did I go back to fast food knowing that this was not going to work? Yeah, it was foolish indeed. Fast forward to 1999. I briefly returned to Montreal. I was referred back to another work program. It involved a fully functioning catering service. It was specific to help people with diagnosis of mental illnesses certified by a doctor that we could work. And we had the diagnosis as indicated. I did learn how to cook at a young age. I was apprehensive about going back to the food service after several failures. But this was a catering service with a clientele that was made up of nonprofits such as seniors luncheons, for example. They also sold pre-made meals to the community to help raise funds to keep them going. Plus, this was a back-to-work program for those with mental health issues, such as yours truly. So I would find, again, kindred spirits, people who would be just like me. I actually thrived in the environment. Gone were the substandard donuts, disgusting, ill-smelling kitchens, and all that grease. But there was one problem. They were not paying out a salary, nor was the welfare office by then, known as Emploi Quebec. So we were given a small stipend of 100 per month, maximum allowable to welfare recipients with disability, disability supplement. They did have a new six-month contract positions offered under the Emploi Quebec Wage Subsidy Program where a worker could get the normal minimum wage. I did apply for such a position, but to no avail. They did tell me I gave a good interview, but they already had somebody else in mind. Oh, great. So it was good enough to work their kitchens at $100 a month, but not good enough for an actual salary, even at minimum wage. Today, the union activist in me realizes we were exploited there, 
And this happens all too often. Those who are either intellectually disabled or on the autism spectrum or with mental health issues were still exploited. It's hard to get hired at normal salary, let alone benefits, with same employment standards and laws as everyone else. There are organizations in Montreal who do cater to helping those with disabilities, mental health, or the DI network who are exploited. I turned out to be one of their best cooks nonetheless. I ended up leaving the program after a year. Fast forward the year 2001. And yet again, I found myself having to start my life over again. This time in my 30s. I moved back to Montreal from Lac Mégantic. With the financial help of my parents, I was preparing to go to a tech program run by the English Montreal School Board. It was in desktop publishing, computer graphics. I was looking forward to that. If that was a success, perhaps I would have revisited the idea of going back to art school to learn graphic arts, become a graphic artist. What a concept, earning a living doing something you might like. All that time, I had always tried to take any measures, job training, learning new trades and skills, etc., etc. I think I was doing much of it for the wrong reasons, looking back. I just wanted to be normal, conform to the norm I was always preached at. I was tired of being stigmatized for both my mental health conditions and my other deficits, like with my fine motor skills. Tired of being kept out of society because of my failures with employment or school. By this time, as it is today, we are largely defined by society by how we earn a buck. Also, I was fresh off coke and speed. Yet again, this time I was going at cold turkey. By then I was fed up with therapists and doctors. Sure, there were some withdrawal symptoms, but they were manageable. One thing, boys and girls, if you're new to sobriety or thinking of getting off drugs, please, please check with a healthcare professional. And no, not the rewired soul for the love of God. I don't really recommend going cold turkey. I was moving into another shared housing situation. Man, that home was weird. I always had l weird living situations. No wonder why I moved around a lot. Okay, here we go. Again, in Montreal Southwest, in the district of Cote St. Paul. The other side of the Lachine ca Canal, from my old hood of St. Henry. The couple who ran the home rented rooms out to international language students, which was interesting. Met a lot of interesting people, but they also ran an escort service. That, my friends, was even more weird. It was the worst kept secret from those international students living at the home. I may well write a short story about that one. Again, I digress. I did get into the desktop publishing program and was learning the techniques of pre-press but I ended up having another breakdown of sorts, and it was a huge one. My living situation with the escort service couple had broken down at that point. I ended up having to temporarily move in with the ex from Lac Megantic's aunt and uncle who lived near the school I was attending. This was compounded by a psych cocktail of Rivotril painkillers to deal with persistent headaches and knee pain and some antidepressants. Oh, I forget what that was. So I also showed up at the school on the side effects of all three drugs. And well, I got sloppy for lack of a better term. They thought I was purposely trying to OD at the school. I was expelled. 
albeit temporarily, from the program. I did fight the expulsion with no lawyers, but with the help of my father, who was giving me tips on how to research cases from the Ministry of Education and so forth. My father was a high school teacher uh, for the public school system in Montreal, so he knew the ins and outs. I don't have to tell you it was one of the toughest fights of my life. It was the first time I ever fought back against any sort of administrative legal matter. I was successful. I was readmitted to school through six months later, but was to go at night instead of in the daytime. I gathered that the director didn't want to look at my face again. I was more than okay with that. I got my certificate in 2003. This is quite significant, not only because of the fight to get my expulsion lifted, but also it would be the first time I actually completed a school or training program of any sort since graduating high school. To many, this kind of thing is rote. But to someone like yours truly, this is a huge deal actually cause for celebration, but unfortunately there was no work in the field. By the time I had finished my diploma, the field was already pretty saturated, but I did not want to go back on welfare, again because of the stigma attached, and I still had a desire to be normal, to fit in. It was always a painful feeling left out of everything or being bullied because I was too vulnerable, too sensitive, too emotional. I had updated my computer skills, so I started looking for a job in customer service at a call center to at least get myself back on the workforce. I found one in a field that could not have been more ill-suited to me. Job that required nerves of steel and was some of the rudest, most screwed up clientele and co-workers. It was that of a phone operator for Montreal's largest taxi company at the time. I think it still is. The pressures, the speed, the stress. I was constantly being threatened with being fired. The gossip was in the background. People talking, when's she going to get canned? When's she going to get canned? Sure, the place was unionized, but it was an impotent union. Very impotent local, with only two reps who were in the job more to stroke their egos than to help their colleagues. It was just another click mentality. So, hell, once again, back in high school, when would I bloody well leave high school? I hated high school when I was in high school. I made the mistake of dating a co-worker. Although he worked a different shift than I did, this particular dude was well respected in the company. So when the relationship broke down, guess who everybody over there sided with? I know, workplace drama and gossip. This to say, boys and girls, I do not advise office romances. Never ends well. Also, at that time, I was fighting against not relapsing back into coke and speed. It was around that taxi company, and it was the closest I had gotten to dope pushers since I had left Lac Megansic. Back to cowering in the ladies' room, having emotional breakdowns and meltdowns, feeling trapped, multiple panic attacks. I had gotten another job as a dispatcher at a smaller taxi company with fewer people in the office, which was okay. I got to learn how the STM paratransit system worked and such. And working paratransit was something I actually liked. But hell, the company was bloody chaotic. Again, trying to be strong at every turn to survive the job, but was headed for another breakdown. The, it would seem that the harder I tried, the weaker I was feeling, the more tired I was feeling. The less steady on my feet I was. 
following a psych or ER visit, I ended up having to quit that job too. And I got on EI, otherwise known as employment insurance, with medical. I was no longer even able to get out of bed at that point. I was that exhausted. I would just be winded walking from point A in my apartment to point B. And believe me, I didn't live in a big apartment. I was living in a studio. I was an emotional mess. I was also in a lot of physical pain all the time on my back. And I was nauseated much of the time too. By that time in 2006, I really had no fight in me at all. Yep, once again, kids, I failed. By that time, I had decided to give up climbing up again. I always took a nosedive anyway, so why bother? At least I couldn't fall anymore. But I also knew that the EI would not last forever. And I did not want to go back on welfare with or without a disability supplement. That would be even worse, especially in my late 30s, vocationally speaking, it became do or die. So with the help of an emploi Quebec counselor, I had decided to try returning to school, this time to Collège Hansik to pursue a tech diploma. The program was given in French, a language that I am proficient in orally, but had difficulty with writing it. I was, however, informed that I would be allowed to write any exams in English, though. The program was once again in the printing industry, but the administrative side of things, estimating, project management, it would be a 10 month program beginning in 2007, so I signed on. That was not without its stressors though. The classmates were not very cordial with me. I did not fit in. I was the youngest in the class, but heck, Who'd have thunk a group of middle-aged people could behave just like a high school clique yet again? The instructor who taught the bulk of the classes was an, was an ass. A right-wing ass who believed even an employee who took a few minutes to go to the washroom was a waste of time and money and resources on any company. Yeah, not for nothing I referred to him as the Prince of Darkness. I somehow passed all my courses, completed the diploma, so two diplomas post high school under my belt. No university degree, but still quite an accomplishment nonetheless, for yours truly, that is. Spring 2008, I had a job in my latest field as an estimator for a large format printing company. I liked the work but hated the way the place was run. Once again, run by a mean girl click. I saw 18 people in a three month period either leave voluntarily or get fired. It was frankly a miracle that the company owners managed to remain in business as long as they had because they let their personal feelings get involved when hiring people instead of looking at qualifications. In other words, they were not hiring the best people. They were hiring people they liked. My last supervisor was over there was a 23-year-old Barbie doll. When I say Barbie doll, kids, I mean Barbie doll. Fresh out of university with no work or life experience. Oh, that ought to end well, right? It was easy to see why she was hired by the president. She ran the office like her power click in high school. In no time, it got to a point where I was feeling trapped yet again. I started throwing up almost every morning. And kids, no, I was not pregnant. Dreading the day. I was hoping to remain there for a year to get my chops in the industry and then find another job at a print shop. I had to train Barbie boss to learn how to be well. My boss. I mean, how effed up is that? She was never available to listen to any concerns I had, which were my ongoing battles with production, which were screwing up constantly, and quality control was lacking. For example, covering up a printing error on a vinyl banner 
for a high-end shoe store by scribbling with magic marker. Kids, I wish I was kidding. I'm not. Or sales reps so hungry for a commission that they were slashing prices to the point where the prices were lower than the cost of production. Who would know the cost of production of everything better than I did? I was the estimator, after all. I provided the estimations for the president. But, hey, no one was hearing me. Yep, the concerns were more often than not met with indifference or that I was just playing crazy. Three weeks after Barbie Boss started, she fired me. Yeah, the thanks I get for teaching her how to do her job, right? <laughs> Months later, I found my next job. It would also be my last job as a public servant, secretary for a social service agency under the Ministry of Health and Social Services. The longest time I ever stayed at a job to the point it became an integral part of my identity. Also the most rewarding job I had or would ever hope to have. Also the job that led to my retirement, which I said will be a separate video uploaded by the end of this week. So I'm going to leave you on that note. That's going to do it for this video, boys and girls. If you are interested in being interviewed for this series, there are links to contact me below in the description box. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and please consider subscribing and hit that ringy dingy icon below so you can be notified every time I upload. Please take care of yourselves and each other. Always remember to look in on those most vulnerable. It will likely make all the difference in their lives knowing that someone cares. Straight talking, Fedora Chick, over and out.